Prime Minister, Excellencies, dear friends, very good morning, afternoon, and evening to you all. I hope that wherever you are in the world, you are well and safe in these strange and indeed extraordinary times. Welcome to this uh, high level meeting on sustainable ocean business and 2030 agenda. Only a few months ago, we all thought that this meeting was to take place in Portugal as part of the UN Ocean Conference co-hosted by Portugal and Kenya. Then the world suddenly changed. However, the, even the profound and wide-ranging impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic has not changed the intrinsic fundamental relationship between the ocean and the 17 sustainable development goals. If anything, for the future that we want, we need more than ever healthy, clean, and productive oceans. We need more than ever to improve ocean protection while concurrently increasing ocean production. And this dual global challenge of sustainable ocean management to the benefit of all of humanity is at the core of today's high level meeting. To underpin these common emissions, Global Compact's Ocean Action Platform last fall published the nine principles for sustainable ocean business. A few weeks ago, we launched a blue bond document, a joint undertaking by Global Compact, major banks and institutional investors to design financial instruments targeting sustainable ocean investments. And today, we are proudly publishing the Ocean Stewardship Report 2030 to serve as a roadmap and a reference for governments, business, and academia through this decade of deliveries. At this seminar, we will be joined by an amazing group of experts and key stakeholders deep diving into the five tipping points identified in the report relating to sustainable production of food and renewable energy, decarbonizing shipping, preventing pollution, and increasing knowledge about the ocean space. And every year going forward, at the start of the UN General Assembly week, we will report on the status and progress for each of these five tipping points. Now, before introducing the opening panel, setting the stage for these discussions, it is my true honor to invite opening remarks by the Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Ms. Amina Mohammed. Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear colleagues and friends, thank you for the opportunity to address this online meeting on sustainable ocean business and the 2030 agenda. We've ushered in the first year of the decade of action to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 amidst the unprecedented challenges that have been posed by COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 has put billions of lives and livelihoods at risk, and its impact at sea is as palpable as it is on land. Since the outbreak, ocean-based tourism has come to a halt as restrictions on travel have been imposed worldwide. Cruise operations are suspended, the fishing industry and aquaculture sectors are hit hard due to market and supply chain disruption. Illegal fishing is on the rise as enforcement activity has declined. Global efforts in tackling ocean deoxygenation and acidification will likely be hindered as a result of a prolonged global economic slowdown. The volume of plastic waste associated with medical equipment is soaring. It is clear that we now have even more to do to protect the world's already endangered oceans, seas and marine resources. Beyond their critical role in sustainable development, oceans are also vital in regulating the global climate. However, activities such as marine litter, overfishing and greenhouse gas emissions are leading to the deterioration of marine ecosystems and ocean health. While the United Nations Ocean Conference and COP26 have been postponed, the climate emergency is still with us. In this context, we must act urgently. The sustainable blue economy offers vital opportunities for lifting po people out of poverty, restoring economic and environmental resilience, generating jobs and livelihoods, and building industries of the future while maintaining a healthy marine environment for long-term business operations. To mention just one example, 
The Republic of Seychelles launched its first sovereign blue bond last year, raising $15 million to advance the blue economy. Business engagement is essential, and I'm encouraged that many companies around the world have signed up to the Sustainable Oceans Principles developed by the Global Compact, pledging to take action to prevent pollution, manage the use of marine resources, and be transparent about their ocean-related activities and impacts. For instance, hotel chains such as the Marriott, the Hyatt, the Intercontinental, and others are taking steps to cut off single-use plastics. And at last year's Climate Action Summit, a number of major shipping companies and port cities agreed to fully decarbonize their activities by 2050, and I urge others to follow this same path. Colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, as the pandemic unfolds, we must do our utmost to stay on the pathway towards sustainable development. If governments and all stakeholders place ocean and environmental sustainability and the fight against climate change at the front of economic recovery efforts, we will be able to ensure that economic development and ocean health become mutually supportive. I'm calling upon businesses, big and small, as well as all stakeholders and especially young people to scale up actions to implement the 2030 Agenda and build a more sustainable and resilient future for generations to come. I thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. And now we are turning to our distinguished opening panel, which will look more closely on how we can turn challenges into opportunities and how local and global ocean related efforts may make us all able to deliver on the global goals. And to address these uh, topics, we are honored to be joined by Ms. Erna Solberg, Prime Minister of Norway. She's co-chair of the high level panel on sustainable blue economy. And she's also co-chair of the UN Secretary General's advocacy group for the sustainable development goals. We have uh, Ms. Lisa Kingu, CEO and executive director of the UN Global Compact, Ambassador Peter Thompson, UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean, and Professor Michini Ntiba, Principal Secretary for Fisheries, Aquaculture, and the Blue Economy uh, of the Government of Kenya. So without further ado, I'll turn the screen over to you, Prime Minister Erna Solbeck. Thank you. Uh, today we should have uh, gathered in Lisbon to discuss how ocean action can contribute to the Sustainable Development Goals. Sadly, the world has changed dramatically. Borders are partly closed, ec uh, economies are contracting rapidly, and the ocean is contributing directly in the fight against COVID-19 through enzymes found in the microbes on the deep ocean floor that are used to produce the tests for the virus. In the longer term, the ocean's role in rebuilding sustainable economies post-pandemic will be, become crucial. For many communities, the ocean is a main source of employment and income. Food from the ocean also can play a significant role for food security and nutrition. And it is crucial in meeting the goal of a world without hunger and malnutrition. So ocean-based solutions are also the key to fight climate change and the decrease in biodiversity. This is the approach of the high level uh, panel of sustainable ocean economy, which I co-chair together with the president of Palau. Together with 12 other acting heads of uh, state and government, we are working to advance the benefits associated with sustainable ocean economy. Our recommendation will be launched ahead of the UN Ocean Conference next year and will provide advice on how we can prosper through a combined focus on ocean productivity and protection. But as I also like to underline that a lot has been uh, done already. Innovative low and zero emissions thresholds and ocean wind farms are examples of innovative new business opportunities. What we need to do more. In the UN Global Compact Action Platform for Sustainable Ocean Business, leading industry plays, players uh, show how they intend to play their part. Through climate-based ocean action, we can deliver up to one-fifth of the emission cuts needed to meet the Paris targets. 
As ocean stewards, we must all seize the opportunity for long-term recovery from both the pandemic and the climate crisis. Building back better after the crisis means building back bluer. Through investments in sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, we can provide many times more food than we do today. Concerted efforts such as the UN International Depth on Ocean Research, Decade of Ocean Research, can contribute significantly to achieving better growth. So I hope that this discussion today will bring us a bit closer on the path to a more sustainable recovery and that we have to look beyond the crisis and also to see how we can use this crisis to even uh, increase the development, on or the development on sustainable development goals and the ocean especially in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prime Minister, for those uh, very important uh, reflections. Now, Lisa, in the final two weeks of your tenure as head of the UN Global Compact, uh, please, uh, we look uh, forward to, to listening to your remarks. Thank you, Stella. Prime Minister, Excellences, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, with the coronavirus, we are facing a global pandemic that is devastating people and their livelihoods, disrupting global supply chains, profoundly deepening inequalities and undoing progress on the sustainable development goals. At the same time, we continue to face a global uh, climate emergency with irreversible impacts for people and all the natural systems that sustain us. In the face of these interconnected crises, we cannot afford to tackle one or the other. Human health depends on planetary health. We can and must tackle both. At the UN Global Compact, the world's largest corporate sustainability initiative, we are calling on business leaders everywhere to unite to support workers, communities, and companies uh, affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Together with our 70 local networks, we are mobilizing businesses to commit and take action for the world to recover better. The ocean will play a critical role in this journey. Our ocean provides food, energy, jobs, and economic benefits for people in every country, even those that are landlocked. It is a crucial buffer against climate and a massive resource for sustainable development. In the Ocean Stewardship 2030 report, um, we set the roadmap for both protecting and tapping the full potential of the ocean with five clear areas of action, sustainable seafood, decarbonized shipping, electricity from the ocean, mapping of the ocean, and end waste entering the ocean. I very much welcome today's meeting as we are kicking off a new phase for business, for governments and civil society to take bold and ambitious action for our ocean. And finally, I would like to invite you all to continue the conversation during the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit on the 15th and 16th of June. Uh, this virtual event promises to be bigger, better, and more inclusive than any physical event. The high-level high program will chase the sun to allow our participants and local networks to participate, participate in their own time zones. I look very much forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for that uh, very clear uh, message. Now, Peter, um, I'd like to thank you before, uh, before your uh, intervention for the, uh, for the strong support that you have uh, given to our action platform uh, through, uh, through the years. We are very appreciative of that. Please, Peter. Maybe Are you unmuted, Peter? 
it's a good one. I think I am now. Yeah, you are now. We can hear. Uh, thank you very much, uh, still, for that introduction. Um, look, all courtesies observed, and greetings to everyone gathered here with us in cyberspace. And I <laughs> hope that whatever your circumstances, uh, listeners, that you and your families are safe and well. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Lisa Kingo um, and uh, look, wish her well for the, uh, her future challenges. But to thank Lisa and uh, her team at UN Global Compact for their commitment to ocean action. It's evidenced by today uh, at the Sustainable Ocean Business Meeting and in your production of the uh, excellent Ocean Stewardship 2030 report. And I know that we can depend on UN Global Compact as a strong collegiate supporter in preparations for the all important UN Ocean Conference to be held in Lisbon once conditions allow. The presence of Prime Minister Solberg on this panel also allows me to thank her and the Norwegian government for the outstanding commitment made to SDG 14's implementation through the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy, uh, whose ongoing work is guiding us towards the right balance between protection and production, between conserving and sustainably using the ocean's resources. So on behalf of all of us, uh, thank you, Prime Minister. In addressing the business community today, I'd like to repeat something I said at the opening of the World Economic Forum's virtual ocean dialogues yesterday. We all know that governments and corporations are facing very difficult decisions at this time of planning and managing the, the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. And we must face the fact that prolonged global economic slowdown runs an associated risk of reduced commitment to climate action. Such resolution cannot be allowed to happen. And surely by now everybody knows the existential reasons why that is so. Without a net, carbon, a net zero carbon world by 2050, we'll be placing future generations of humans in great jeopardy. In a pandemic world, it may be tough for decision makers and breadwinners to think long-term when the short-term exigencies of crisis and supply management are priority. But this is the time when decisions on massive financial commitments are in train. And before the seal is set upon them, we have to ensure that the consequences of taking a low road back to global warming, fossil fuel dependent, plastic polluting world that we knew are understood and avoided. In the name of our children, we must urge governments, development banks, agencies, and corporations to think of our long-term responsibilities and invest now in clean, blue-green infrastructure for a better future for us all. Ocean action is absolutely central to investment for a better future and the generation of jobs worldwide. But be it in offshore renewable energy or sustainable aquaculture, new sources of nutrition medicines for the post-antibiotic era, or the greening of shipping. It will be from investment in the sustainable blue economy that a resilient socioeconomic future will emerge for us all. And I thank you for your attention and hand the mic back to you, Stella. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Uh, we look forward to cooperating with you uh, through this uh, decade of delivery on the sustainable uh, development goals. And now, Professor Nitiba. Um, thank you very much, uh, uh, Prime Minister, uh, UN staff that are here, and my friend Peter there, uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. I think for us in Kenya, and particularly when we were waiting to co-host uh, this meeting in Portugal, I think um, COVID-19 has come with all sorts of things and it has made us to realize how uh, so quickly the world can be disorganized and things like that. But I also think that uh, it has also taught us great lessons of how I think as a world we should be able to become better partners, be able to share information particularly now that we are talking about um, growing ocean stewardship uh, at 2030. I think for us 
we who come from uh, developing countries and uh, other small countries uh, realize the need for sharing information for clear and dependable trust and partnerships moving forward because the five the five uh, uh, tipping points that are uh, uh, going to be discussed today become very important for us in terms of moving into the future, the technologies, the, in, in, the innovations that have well been developed, the need for food for all. And you see, for example, in Kenya, we were affected in another way, that uh, there was a lot of flooding around in Kenya, uh, that, uh, for example, even in our small lakes, many of the fish landing sites uh, uh, were flooded, and uh, this causes a lot of problems moving forward. But ladies and gentlemen, I think also it's important to think about the mapping of the sea, not from just the point of view of knowledge and things like that, but also about planning the sea space, because I think it's important so that uh, we can be able to mix areas of conservation, areas of uh, human development, areas of investment, and particularly for us in Kenya, we have taken this uh, in a rather serious manner. We want to, we want to uh, start mapping our sea. We want to have a marine spatial plan so that eventually we have clear areas for conservation. We have clear areas for development in a national uh, uh, maritime master plan, which will then be very good for uh, the issues that uh, we are discussing about the oceans now. Finally, I think I'd like to restate that uh, moving forward, I think it is important for the world to start a very uh, robust ocean literacy, uh, 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 ocean literacy uh, program, so that particularly the young people are able to be aware of the sea, our relationship with the sea, so that eventually we have a world population uh, that is ocean literate, that understands its relationship with the sea. And I think uh, this is important if we are going to have the sea as our friend and us as friends of the sea moving forward. Otherwise, I would like to wish everybody uh, uh, good deliberations and discussions, and that I hope that uh, one day we are going to have our conference moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor and Tiba, for uh, offering these very important uh, perspectives. So, uh, a warm thanks to Prime Minister Sulberg, uh, Lisa, Ambassador Peter Thompson, and uh, Professor Ntiba for this uh, interesting round of uh, uh, reflections. And now, to moderate the next uh, panel, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to give uh, the floor, or rather the screen, to uh, <laughs> Mr. Eric Yaxley, Head of the Ocean Action Platform for Sustainable Ocean Business at the UN Global Copa. Please, Eric. Thank you. There, I think we're better. Thank you so much. We are now going to have five panels discussing the five tipping points, part of the Ocean Stewardship 2030 roadmap. Going forward, this will be the focus for a decade of ocean action at the UN Global Compact, and we will take stock at every General Assembly High Level Week in the next 10 years to see how are we faring in business and governance of the oceans. I think it was very well addressed by the first segment here, uh, how important it is to work together with the private sector and good governance to achieve the potential of the ocean and secure the health of the ocean. The first session is on sustainable seafood. And with a growing world population and increasing demand for healthy, and nutritious food, the ocean may play a very key role in delivering, delivering on a number of sustainable development goals, if we get it right. So what does it entail 
to be an ocean steward in the seafood industry. Mm -hmm. To talk about this, we have three panelists. It's Honorable Jane Lubchenko, Distinguished Professor at Oregon State University. We have Guy Molvik, CEO of CERMAC. And we have Mr. Kui dong -Yu, Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. First, it's my pleasure to give the floor to you, Jane Lubchenko, please. Prime Minister, Excellencies, distinguished speakers and guests, we have seen in times past that occasionally, out of the darkest of times, people rise up to confront what seem like insurmountable challenges to create a new world, a world with hope, a world born of passion and science, a world in which people come together in new ways, inspired by a collective vision of what could be not what is. I believe we are witnessing just such a time of reawakening, renewal, and recreation. We are recognizing how central the ocean is to our very existence and to a vibrant future. For example, the ocean panel introduced a few minutes ago by Prime Minister Solberg uses science to connect the dots between ocean health and human health between the ocean and climate change. It draws on experience to recognize that a healthy ocean is the sine qua non for a vibrant economy and resilient communities. And it inspires leaders to be bold, to take action. The Global Compact's Ocean Stewardship 2030 report amplifies many of these themes, leading with the overarching need to transition rapidly to smart, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. Food from the sea is the key to global food security. And yet immense challenges threaten delivery on that promise. We have ample evidence that reforming fisheries can work, but inertia, poor governance, and perverse incentives present significant obstacles to success. Make no mistake, Fisheries and aquaculture today are in transition with both the best and the worst coexisting simultaneously. The future hangs in the balance. At this pivotal moment, one of the novel partnerships that I'm most excited about is CBOS, Seafood Businesses for Ocean Stewardship, an innovative collaboration between scientists at the Stockholm Resilience Center and the CEOs of 10 of the largest seafood companies in the world. This is exactly the type of creative thinking and focus on accountability that can lead to transformative outcomes. Still in its formative years, CBOS is making impressive progress, but has yet to deliver on its promise of bold action. It inspires me that business leaders across multiple cultures have been willing to work closely with scientists to define a new vision for businesses that use the ocean without using it up. An existential threat, climate change, brought the CBOS leaders together, but new knowledge gained, the mutual benefit derived from intermediate steps and the power of the collective is keeping them at the table. Without any doubt, climate change presents immense threats to the future of food from the sea. However, as Steve Gaines, Chris Costello, and the Environmental Defense Fund team have concluded, reforming fisheries is actually one of the smartest ways to offset many of the negative effects of climate change. Reforming fisheries can make them more resilient to climate changes. These scientific findings provide much needed win-win solutions. Seafood is not only key to global food security, it's also a powerful path to helping reduce carbon emissions from the global food system. And so making fisheries and aquaculture sustainable and climate resilient must be a top priority. So too must be the protection of significant fraction of the ocean in fully to highly protected and implemented marine protected areas because healthy fisheries and aquaculture depend ultimately on a healthy, productive, and resilient ocean. We need to move past the outdated assumption that seafood production and fully protected marine protected areas are in conflict. In fact, 
They are highly compatible and both are urgently needed. In summary, the ocean sustains and feeds us. It connects us. The ocean is so central to our future that it behooves us to embrace the challenges and tackle problems with renewed vigor. I am reminded of Dr. Martin Luther King's words of over 50 years ago about what he called the fierce urgency of now. And I quote, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still the thief of time. The tide in the affairs of men does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage, but time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. We still have a choice today, unquote. And so I invoke Martin Luther King's fierce urgency of now words to launch this panel because we dare not squander the time we have. Today, even in the midst of a pandemic, human suffering, social and economic disruption, we come together to say, we understand these challenges are connected and we pledge to work together in unprecedented ways to create a new, sustainable, just and vibrant world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Words. So for the next speaker, the CEO of Cermak is a leading aquaculture company and a partner of CBUS network that Jane just talked about. Cermak has also been a pioneer in enabling many global dialogues on sustainable aqu aquaculture. So please, Guy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Um, dear all, uh, the seafood industry is dependent on a healthy ocean. We grow our fish in the ocean and we are dependent on marine ecosystems and resources coming from the ocean. It is really this simple. There is no seafood industry in a dead ocean. Seafood has a central role in society. Whether wild or farmed, people need nutritious food. As a food producer, it is our responsibility to ensure that people have access to safe and healthy food. In our daily business as salmon farmers, we feel directly the negative consequences of climate change and pollution. We need to adapt, but also make sure we are not a part of the problem. Ocean stewardship involves taking responsibility for our environmental footprint. Production of food will leave a footprint and we need to make sure that as a whole, seafood is part of the solution. Collaboration is an important tool for ocean stewardship. To succeed, we must take responsibility for our value chain, ensuring that the feed we buy is sustainably sourced and our suppliers respect human rights. That is why we have become a part of the Global Seafood Partnership, Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship, called CBOS, to ensure a sustainable value chain. We engage with the high level panel for a sustainable ocean economy to work with policymakers and science encouraging science-based regulations. And we are patrons in the UN Global Compact, working across the ocean industries, because we, as food producers in the ocean, need a common structure and governance across sectors, within nations and in international waters. A key task for me as a business leader is about balancing priorities. And in this perspective, I view collaboration across sectors and geographies as very important. We need this discussion, balancing 
priorities, collecting data, discussing options, and developing the solutions that do most good and least harm. In the seafood industry, a healthy ocean is fundamental and ocean stewardship is essential for doing business. We engage in ocean stewardship not only because we want to, but because we have to. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. Very important points, and I think the role of the business is important, not only in the seafood sector, but at the ocean industries at large. To address the UN perspective of this, we are honored to have you, Mr. Ku Dongyu, Director General of the Food and Agriculture Organization with us today. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Professor uh, Eric. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes, thank you very good. Good, so uh, I'm very glad, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, and I uh, saw so some uh, old friends and also the Honorable uh, uh, Prime Minister is there. So I think in the, uh, today's meeting eh, and the uh, sustainable seafood is the number one uh, uh, important food for me, eh? especially I grew up from the uh, 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 area which is uh, so many lakes and rivers. And so we, we can't get it. We can't get rid of the seafood or, or, or fish every day. <laughs> Thank you indeed. Over the years, FAO has developed many guidelines uh, and standard and norms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to, to you know, for, for the uh, guiding all the fish uh, uh, production and, and uh, this product uh, uh, is knowledge products are uh, based on the FAO code of conduct for responsible fisheries, which is 25th uh, anniversary we are celebrating this year. So FAO is a quite a long commitment uh, and we are celebrating 75 years anniversary this year. Even two years earlier than UN, FAO was established in 1943 yeah? Yeah. In, in Canada. The code is a mainly policy framework that guides in the development of sustainable fishery and aquaculture practice all over the world. Over two years of FAO published the State of the World Fisheries and Aquaculture Report, we call it SOFIA. Uh, uh, that also presented the global state of implementation of the code. This year, we will launch the SOFIA through the webinar uh, uh, due to the pandemic on next Monday, yeah, 8th of June. Uh, and I encourage you all to attend the lunch and to listen to the scientific evidence that support my statement today. I wanted to emphasize the two uh, things, uh, both the capture fishery and aquaculture production. It's a, now it's at the highest level, record level today. It makes a crucial contribution to global food and nutrition livelihood security. So this success is shared while we all have a responsibility to ensure production record are uh, sustainably achieved and maintained. Evidence show that the natural culture is that the Maria fish stock, which are subjected to intensive management measure, are rebuilding. Biomasses are growing and the sustainability target are being met. So we should be a little bit optimistic. Uh, a lot of people talk about the, 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 uh, uh, the threat and the problems. Of course, we need the, to, to address the problem. But at the same time, we have to keep the livelihood of the human human being yeah, and the consumers uh, and the fishermen also. That's a real success. However, in the place where the fishers management are poor or non-existent, the ecological sustainability of marine fishery are in decline. Uh, last year I was in Norway, I also uh, participated in uh, our ocean 2019. I, I mentioned that. We couldn't allow this to continue as it does. We will not achieve the SDGs. So good management is the best conservation for the uh, natural maria uh, resources and the fish. Uh, and our ocean, coast, the inland water should be fully assessed and managed on the basis of the ecosystem approach to achieve the ecological sustainability. But uh, potential, uh, the big potential is the aquaculture, in my opinion. Contrary to the catch of fish, that's which is natural uh, 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 production, 
But the aquaculture sector is still under development. It has been the fastest growing, fastest growing food product sector globally for the last 50 years. Mm. And growing at an average of 5.3% per year since the turn of this century. So it's 20 years, uh, it's ever increasing. We need this growth to continue in order to reduce hunger and malnutrition because we will have a 10 billion population in 2050. Yeah? Today, yeah. yeah, almost 90% of global aquaculture is produced in Asia, only 2.5% in Africa. And in this continent, Europe, hard mm. to see, only a small proportion in the Mediterranean region. So if we promote the innovation and scale up lessons learned, if we reduce the environmental impact and implement the appropriation biosecurity measure, and aquaculture will be open the great opportunity for future growth and the food insecurity area. So, and the solution, we need the innovation, in short. We need the uh, uh, public and private collaboration. We need the, the uh, uh, proper policy. And we need the uh, support, the, the investment, the uh, fishermen, uh, and also aquaculture. Uh, that's a solution. If we, I said, if we can uh, develop the one percent of aquaculture, we can serve the 99 percent of Maria Cacho or, or fresh water. So UN compact, uh, it's a key role to play here. So we need also the uh, build up a consensus hand in hand. What I initiated, what I come to uh, DG. So we need all the. Uh, international organization, private sector, uh, and academic people, and also private sector work together and hand in hand and make the sustainable development the aquaculture and the fishery sector to save the world for the future and the, and the long time. And that's a way clear message I want to share with you. Let's work together, learn it together, and contribute together. Make the uh, global still blue, and Chris clean. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think that is an important takeaway from this session. We have a lot of ground to cover today. I mean, we're going through all the ocean sectors. So I'll just briefly sum up. We need it to be science-based, but Jane asked for bold action from the companies. Geir says they are willing to work on a global scale to set good standards. We have 150 coastal communities with different national legislation. We need good policies at a global scale, as FAO Kwa uh, Dong-Yung said in the end, and we good, need uh, investments. We will return actually to investment at the very end of this uh, seminar today, but thank you so much for the seafood panel. That was great input from us to take forward towards the next General Assembly. Thank you so much. Our next session is on the opposite, it's a very globally regulated sector. It's shipping, being globally regulated for centuries and decades uh, by the IMO and UNCLOS. Uh, we have a very distinguished group of people that will look into the future and see how will the sh shipping industry play a role in achieving the SDGs by 2030. We have Kwai Le Hoon, Chief Executive of the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore, we have Rodolf Sade, Chairman and CEO of SEMA CGM, the shipping company. And we have Mr. Kitak Lim, Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization. We're going to start with you, Ms. Kwai Le Hon, uh, Chief Executive of the Maritime Port Authority of Singapore. What is the role of ports and what's the connection of land and sea and the shipping's future role for meeting the SDGs? The floor is yours. Thank you. Prime Minister, Excellencies, distinguished guests, a very good evening from Singapore. Um, let me just first commend UN Global Compact for gathering us here. Good to see Eric uh, with this common goal of advancing towards the UN 2030 SDGs. Um, and, spe and specifically to form this panel on shipping, bringing together players from the IMO, industry and ports. Now, to address Eric's question, I thought I would first share some thoughts on the macro trends in view of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. The economic repercussions are far-reaching. For shipping, we'll be looking at disruption of global supply chain. We'll be seeing a rethinking towards nearshoring. For the global and local economy, the most feared recession would affect jobs and livelihood. Yet, as the pandemic slows human activities, we actually witness how it could restore the ocean to some degree to its natural balance. 
And therefore, we are here today to see how, while we tackle the immediate challenges of COVID-19, it also prevents an opportunity for us, for the governments and for the industries to leave behind business as usual mindsets and transit into a new normal that will be more sustainable. Now, on your question about the role of ports uh, in terms of connection between land and sea, Singapore, when it comes to digitalization and decarbonization, and that will be two proposals I'll put forth, we are committed to work with the International Maritime Organization and member states to achieve the 2030 and 2050 greenhouse gas reduction goal. The two proposals I have today first pertains to digitalization, digital oceans. We need greater digitalization and harmonization of data in the maritime supply chain. In times of pandemic, the digitalization of shipping not only reduces human interactions, but it also allows shipping to yield a new level of efficiency. Now, digital oceans can allow ships, ports, and global trade platform to tra uh, share data and interoperate seamlessly with each other. This allows us to commit to common data exchange protocols and connect isolated data leaks. The outcome, more efficient voyages, lower resultant emissions. The second proposal is on decarbonization. A circle of collaboration would be helpful. We recognize the value of partnership among government, industry, and academia. And this is why we actually have set up an international advisory panel to harness the expertise of local and international leaders. We've also launched a $40 million Singapore dollar maritime green future fund to create ecosystems of trials and test paintings of low carbon technologies. There are already, of course, ongoing efforts uh, by my distinguished panelists um, here, um, IMO and CMACGM. Uh, we can perhaps build on this collaborative spirit to accelerate the trials and adoption of more efficient and greener technologies for shipping. This circle of collaboration together with the IMO will allow us to bring ports, industry and governments together to share the knowledge of all the trials that we have been doing and uh, allow us to commit to some concrete actions moving forward. Uh, I, I'm going to just conclude here because uh, there's still many speakers after me. I thought I would con conclude by citing Mr. Kitat Lim, who is on the panel here, to quote, the voyage has just started towards a more environmentally friendly and low carbon future that the sector must attain, unquote. So indeed, the journey has started and we are excited to collaborate with like-minded partners on this voyage towards a more sustainable shipping and ports. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ms. Quayle. Excellent remarks. And, and that's a good segue to our next speaker because uh, shipping carries 90% of all world trade. And that is a heavy weight. And uh, what will be the future entail for this very, very important seg uh, sector? Mr. Rudolf Sade, Chairman and CEO of SEMA CGM. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon. The COVID-19 epidemic has highlighted the weaknesses of today's world. The crisis has enhanced our collective responsibility to transform our development models. During the pandemic, transport and logistics played a key role in the transit of essential supplies. Today, we are presented with a unique opportunity to reshape international economic exchanges. As a global leader in transport and logistics, we want to participate in the achievement of a balanced globalization, which contributes to economic and social development whilst respecting humanity and protecting the planet. This new globalization must support the sustainable development goals. It is our responsibility altogether to define new shipping and logistics systems whilst continuing to strive for the globalization we want to witness tomorrow. As a family business, we have to be a responsible player. It's a deep and natural conviction which we have had for many years. We have already made some strong commitments and reached ambitious achievements. On a societal level, our foundation provides assistance to more than 10,000 children each year. We support numerous charities working in fields such as education, disability, or illness all around the world. From an environmental aspect, we have taken the following actions. During the G7 summit last year, 
I announced that no CMA CGM vessel would follow the Northern Sea Route in the future. I made this decision because I'm convinced that we have to protect this precious ecosystem. With a 48% reduction in CO2 emissions per container per, per kilometer since 2008, we have exceeded 10 years ahead of schedule the IMO's target of a 40% reduction by 2030. Last year, we reduced our total CA2 emission by 6%. These significant reductions were made possible thanks to our mobilization, the technological innovations implemented, and an improved management of vessel operations. In the coming weeks, a further milestone will be reached. We will take delivery of our first 23,000 container gas propelled container ship. This is a worldwide premiere resulting in the reduction of greenhouse gas emission from 15 to 20% and the suppression of almost all sulfur and fire particle emissions. This is a major event. It symbolizes the path that we are taking in terms of energy transition using the most advanced eco-friendly technology available today. We must move forward. And I'm very pleased to announce that our energy supplies will include 10% alternative fuels by 2023. And our 2050 objective is to be carbon neutral. We are facing many challenges. It is time to act. Each of us can do it individually, but we'll be even stronger if we take action together, businesses, international institutions, policymakers, and NGOs. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Minister Rodolf Sadeh. Very important remarks. Uh, as we know, it's a global industry with global players that need global rules to have a level playing field. Uh, it's an ambitious industry setting targets and we need real strong ambitions also on the policymakers. So it's my honor to give the floor to our next speaker, Mr. Kita Klim, Secretary General of the International Maritime Organization. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to join this high-level meeting. And it is needless to say that the shipping services to deliver vital goods is a critical, particularly under these challenging pandemic times. However, the single biggest challenge is we are still facing is the battle against climate change issues. IMO has adopted, as you know, an initial detailed strategy for decarbonization with the clear targets and ambitions. Importantly, the reduction of total annual GHG emissions by at least 50% by 2050 compared to 2008, which means a reduction of over 80% for individual ships. This strategy includes ship's design equipment, propulsion efficiency, and operational practices, and future fuels. At the same time, IMO is pursuing efforts to phase out GHG emission completely as soon as possible within this century. Member government, shipping, and the shipbuilding industry, port industry, classification society, and technical R&D institution, we all are highly committed to meeting the target. Above all, new pure technologies will be vital in the IMO strategy. While research into developing zero carbon Marine fuel is underway with hydrogen, ammonia, and biofuels, and electricity considered viable. More action is needed to speed up this process. As you know well, shipping industry offered five billion US dollars for R&D for future fuel for next 10 years. Amazing offer. To achieve this, I am just stepping up its efforts to act as a global forum and the promoter of R&D in zero carbon marine fuels, bringing together all stakeholders from public and private sectors. In parallel, 
IMO will embark on emission reduction mechanism like a market-based measure to encourage the uptake of alternative re renewable fuel for the future. Lastly, IMO continue to expand the technical cooperation capacity building project for developing countries, particularly small island developing countries. IMO is currently having and preparing for informal and formal virtual meetings to discuss key policy issues, particularly including GHG issues to keep momentum of our current strategy. Shipping remain unchallenged as the carrier of goods in truly sustainable ways. But I would like to emphasize all our stakeholders within the maritime community, public sector, private sector, member states, port authorities, all we are highly, highly committed and we are in a high level of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kitaglim. A very interesting perspective. And I think the R&D fund, you know, proposed by the industry itself, welcomed by the UN organizations. I think that will be a milestone, an important achievement if we can um, get it off the ground. And these are some of the issues that we will target at the General Assembly Week in New York, virtual or live uh, going forward, to take stock every year toward 2030. And just to sum up some of the inputs we got from this distinguished panel, as Koi Leohun said, there is opportunity now for digitalization and efficiency. As Rudolf Sadeza said, the industry is ready to make the ships more efficient, but we need new innovations and investments. And of course, as IMO has been a pioneer on, we need to work together to get all the member states behind us on this very important journey. Thank you so much, all of you, for taking part in this session. Thank you. Thank you. We are now moving to our next uh, uh, panel, which is also a core ocean industry sector, uh, the energy sector on harnessing ocean electricity. The ocean holds an immensurable amount of energy in wind, tidal and wave. And to give us a perspective on the future of renewables of ocean uh, energy, we're going to have interventions from Mr. Francesco Lacamara, the Director General of the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. We're going to hear from Thomas Thun Andersen, his chairman of both, both Lloyd's Register and Ørsted. And we're going to have the uh, perspective from the policymakers from His Excellency Hussein Rashid Hassan, the Minister of Environment from Maldives. But first, it's my honor to give the floor to you, Mr. Francesco Lacamara, uh, Director General of IRENA. Please. The floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, I wish to thank the UN Global Compact for convening this important meeting, which can help strengthen the momentum to advance SDG 14 and the Ocean Action Agenda. Oceans are a source of abundant renewable energy potential, capable of driving a global blue economy. Ocean renewables include ocean energy like tidal and wave te technology, as well as offshore wind and floating solar PV. Importantly, especially in today's context, they provide economic opportunities, create jobs, serve as a clean power source for desalinization, cooling, agriculture, sh and shipping, and contribute to achieving multiple SDGs. Its potential is vast, with estimate ranging, ranging from 45,000 to 130,000 terawatt of electricity per year. This means up to two to six times the current global electricity demand. We see that this increasing tappet, this is increasing tappet. By 2018, the world's installed offshore wind capacity was about 24 gigawatts. For ocean energy, the installed capacity remain limited to 535 megawatts. Ahea, they are developed rapidly, have a considerably growth potential. And as our report on cost launched today shows an increasing competitiveness. Offshore renewables are particularly promising for seats as well as large coastal areas. Several challenges 
as lowering uptake. These include high upfront technology costs, lack of enabling framework and policy, as well as non-mature supply chain. I think it is important that when overcoming these challenges, we don't consider offshore renewables as a standalone technology. Rather, we should see them as an holistic solution that adds value to industries and communities. In light of this, we should also consider them in COVID-19 recovery packages. packages. ARENA, as the leading global intergovernmental organization for an energy transition, support international cooperation, capacity building, and knowledge exchange to accelerate the adoption of ocean energy and offshore renewables. We also gather data on business case and analysis trends in the sector. Further to this, we collaborate closely with the private sector, given the central role and leadership of industries in testing and developing offshore technology. Member country requested ARENA in the occasion of uh, our last General Assembly to facilitate targeted collaboration in this space and we are together with governments to establish a collaborative framework on ocean and energy, which I hope you'll be able to join soon. A blue economy powered by offshore renewables is an important component for recovering and building better. And it requires all of us to join forces and bodily and decisively work together to make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so, uh, so much, uh, Francesco. Very, very interesting perspective here. And, you know, I must agree, it's a huge potential if we get it right and collaborate on this. Uh, to discuss that a bit more, uh, we have invited uh, Thomas Dunar Andersen. He's chairman, both the Class Society Lloyds Register and the large renewable uh, wind uh, and offshore wind uh, company Ørsted from Denmark uh, and he will uh, tell us a bit how it is to be a part of two cornerstone ocean companies. Please Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First a word of scale as talked about by others as well. If we just look at the northern seas, um, we could provide the potential so much energy that it equates the sum of all the coal-fired power plants in Europe twice over. So the potential is absolutely there. So if we look at the oceans, we look at the wind, we look at the other energy uh, opportunities we have, including storage, we can really offer decarbonization strategies for, for both countries, for districts, for retail users, and for companies. And for me, at a high level, this is what ocean stewardship is really about. So with this enormous potential, what are the barriers? Or to be slightly more optimistic, what are the opportunities? They fall in four categories. Policies. We have seen many good examples of policy frameworks that have successfully pushed things forward. We do, however, now see many different companies, districts, and so on, coming with different policies and frameworks, and it's beginning to complicate matters. So we have a call for simplicity, for long-term, to reward risk, and especially to, ward, to reward speed. We need to accelerate these things. Another very important policy issue is around the marine, marine spatial planning. And that includes the users, all the different users of the oceans. Two examples, in Ørsted, in a fairly uh, specific way, we are in, engaged with fishermen throughout the world to find out how can we combine the areas for both wind and fishery. In Lloyd's, through our charitable organization, we donate money and coordinate research around farming within the areas. That is more practical examples of ocean stewardship. If I look at the commercial models, I believe that there is a huge opportunity out there with the big industrial companies to team up with the big utilities and put together packages that actually provides renewable offshore wind into the industries. And that will in, in a very limited way, i.e. with a limited number of people involved, 
make a significant impact. So we really have something that can move scale. We need to focus on supply chain, which is also hugely important. Technology and measurements are my two other areas, uh, or the last two areas. And we need to look at the grid stability, come into other detail around that later. We really look to renewable liquid fuels. And here we can see, for example, in Denmark, we have just as Ørsted together with a handful of other companies just gone public with, will, with what will be one of the world's largest hydrogen refineries, offshore wind, onshore to do the refinery and be a big bit. And then the science-based targeting. So if I go back a few years, I would provocatively say that policymakers and NGOs and so on were pushing the envelope. If I look at what's happening now, I would provocatively say that I think it is actually industry that is ahead, creating solutions, putting money uh, to work, finding good ideas. Now we just need to make sure that both those entities work together rather than against each other so that we can kind of come from the same platform and push things forward, go hand in hand. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the minister from Maldives uh, has not uh, been able to connect. So uh, I will just sum up the key points of this panel. And I think both of you addressed not only the potential of this, this is a huge opportunity for mankind and planet, uh, but we need to institutionalize these opportunities. I think Thomas made a very good point that already we can take advantages of the market forces locally, but we must make sure that we get good global frameworks so we don't we get all these small patterns of regulation. And ocean stewardship, ocean, good ocean management is very important. And I would also like to point at uh, the good work of the, ocean, uh, the high level panel of the Blue Ocean Economy on their integrated ocean management report, the blue paper. It's very similar in its thinking to our Ocean Stewardship 2030 report. We need to look at both land and sea, both land and ocean, when it comes to regulation and planning. And we need to have all the industries and public affairs into one picture. So thank you for that. I think it's uh, actually very encouraging listening to both of you going forward. And we look forward to touch base on this again in September at the UN General Assembly High Level Week. And it's really a segue to the next panel. It's about mapping the ocean. We know that we only have explored about 5% of the ocean. And every second specimen that our researchers find in waters deeper than 4,000 meters are new to man. I mean, it's an enormous biodiversity out there, but it's also an enormous opportunity and resources beneath the ocean seabed in metals and minerals. We have a lot to learn and we have a lot to understand. And science is a precondition for ocean stewardship. And in this panel, we will have uh, interventions from Remy Eriksson. He's a group president and CEO of the DMV GL. We will have Mr. Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabed Authority. And we will have Mr. Vladimir Rybinin, Executive Secretary of the IOC UNESCO. And to start the, um, this panel, please, uh, Remy Eriksson, Head Group President and CEO of the DNVGL. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Eric. Uh, Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, um, data underpins all the five areas we have and will be discussing today. It is the key to ensuring a healthy and productive ocean. But humanity does not yet have that key. There is literally an ocean of data which remains unexplored. But I think there is a potential to change this situation dramatically. Ahead of us is the decade of ocean science that will bring focus and accountability to ocean data collecting and sharing. In addition to the efforts of the scientific community, the honors for action now falls directly on policymakers and international organizations like the IMO but the responsibility also falls on ocean businesses. Here, I believe a mindset shift is needed from a position where data collection has been occasional, occasional and altruistic. Oh, we have a poor line here. Um, Mr. Uh, Ericsson, 
then I think we will move onwards in the program and rather come back to Mr. Eriksson in a minute. Mm. Uh, I think we will move to you, Michael Lodge, Secretary General of the International Seabird Authority. Uh, what is the status on your work? I mean, one of the key assets is the mining code 2020 going forward. Why is that so important for you? Please. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, greetings to everybody from Jamaica. And I'm delighted to contribute to this work of the Global Compact Sustainable Business Platform. Let me also congratulate you on the Ocean Stewardship 2030 report. It's really an outstanding piece of work, very, very interesting. Well, uh, deep sea mining is a new industry, but one that promises great benefits for the world if we can do it right. It's now generally accepted that our societies need new sources of minerals to help us make the transition towards a low carbon future. The World Bank, for example, estimates in a new report that more than 3 billion tons of minerals and metals will be needed by 2050 if we are to achieve a two degree scenario. Of course, like any new industry, there are also risks that we need to manage. Fortunately, we are in the unique position of having the opportunity to regulate the industry before it begins. Thanks to the UN Law of the Sea Convention, this can and will be done through a truly global regulatory system that applies the highest environmental and operational standards. All these rules will be applied equally to states and private sector entities. The convention established the International Seabed Authority with the mandate of managing deep sea mineral resources prudently and in such a way as to benefit everyone. And to turn to the topic of this panel, one of our most important assets in this effort are data. In fact, one of the major contributions of the International Seabed Authority in this respect has been to harness the power of the industry involved in exploration work to gather critical scientific knowledge to inform decision-making processes. If I can put this in more concrete terms, over the past 30 years, there have been more than 800 research cruises to the clarion clipperton zone in the Pacific alone, totally more than 6,000 days at sea. In financial terms, this represents an investment in marine science of several hundreds of million dollars. And this, of course, includes seafloor mapping at extremely fine levels of resolution of some of the deepest and most remote parts of the seafloor, as well as collection and analysis of literally thousands of rock and sediment samples, as well as very important biological specimens. In fact, most of what we have learned about the geology of the seabed and its environmental characteristics over the past 25 years has come from the exploration projects authorized through the International Seabed Authority. And it's through this research, which is broadly shared with all stakeholders, that we will be able collectively to identify the best measures required to protect the marine environment now and into the future. So I hope that everybody will join us in this effort and take part. And I thank you very much, uh, Eric and the Global Compact for this opportunity uh, to speak to all of you about the work of the International Seabed Authority. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. And I believe we have uh, Mr. Remy Eriksson of DMGL back online. So uh, please, Remy, uh, uh, please share some more thoughts from uh, the private sector on the role of science. Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where uh, I <laughs> fell out, but uh, I talked about a mind shift that is needed from a position where data collection has been occasional and altruistic to a position where it must become a normal part of operations for any responsible user of ocean resources. Just as we have seen with, with ballast water management, uh, as an example, over the past few years. And the ocean industries can make an enormous contribution in sourcing and sharing ocean data, but it must be done, of course, in, in the right way, in collaboration between scientists, but also with support and incentives from policymakers. 
And I would like to see a real agenda led by organizations like the IMO with deadlines being set. With even a small amount of scientific guidance and government support, business can make a huge contribution and a huge difference. We can leverage existing assets, such like ships and offshore structures that are sailing and in the waters today as a source of enormous data collection. And we can incorporate state-of-the-art sensing devices into new builds. This includes most critically, I believe, vessels in non-traditional routes like the Arctic. Ocean data collection and sharing does not have to be viewed as a cost. Already there are great examples of how collaboration uh, on marine data leads to very real savings. For example, the estimate by the European Marine Observation Network has said that shared marine data saves users of the network of uh, 1 billion euro per year. There are many great examples of data innovation by leading ocean-based companies, and we need to find ways to capture these best practices so that we collectively, collectively can become wiser on the management of ocean resources and ecosystems. The sustainable ocean principles have clear guidance on this, and here I refer to principle eight on sharing relevant scientific data, and principle nine on transparency in maritime activities. I do think classification societies can play a big part in this quest. They are ideally placed to qualify new technology and foster pre-competitive cooperation to develop recommended practices and standards on data collection and sharing. And in these troubled times where we are all challenged to think about the balance of lives and livelihoods, we need a mindset shift as an ocean industry. Without vastly more and better data, we cannot hope to be stewards of a healthy, productive ocean. And mapping the ocean is a crucial step in charting a course to a sustainable planet. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for those remarks. And I think it's a good segue to our next speaker, because this is not only the decade of action and delivery on the SDGs, this is really the decade of ocean science coming up. So who else to talk about that than Mr. Vladimir Rabienen, Executive Secretary of the IOC UNESCO. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, Eric also Sturla and, and the Global Compact for inviting uh, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, or you call, we call it IOC, uh, to, to address uh, this uh, very, very interesting uh, session. Actually, I enjoy, I'm enjoying it. So I would like, uh, I think, to start, uh, and because you asked Eric about the decade, I would like to, uh, to start by presenting to, to you the vision of the decade. I think it will resonate with everyone. So this uh, is about the science we need for the ocean we want, as simple as that. And uh, the decade will be a platform for everyone, uh, a framework for co to cooperate between businesses, between governments, between the United Nations, scientists, of course, and the general public. So uh, the decade outcomes, very important, societal outcomes of the decade. Uh, we have seven now. We have an uh, ocean that is uh, uh, healthy, resilient, productive, and we have also uh, predicted, safe, accessible, inspiring, and in, uh, engaging ocean. So as you probably can guess, the three first elements are the state of the health of the ocean. But the other four are more about the society. So how we would change, like to change ourselves in order we, we, could, we could enter in harmonious relations with the ocean. So very soon, the IUC of UNESCO, and we consulted with many partners, including with the previous speaker, with Michael Lodge and many others, um, we will present to United Nations the plan for the uh, United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So the process that we anticipate is simple. We need to identify what needs to be done by science, where are the, the gaps in knowledge. We need to develop the capacity of science to deliver. And this capacity has to be existing at two levels. The cutting edge of science, this is uh, the, the, the science of all, you know, uh, of, of developed countries, but also the science that is available in developing countries. So they could benefit and contribute to, 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 to to, to moving forward the science. So two, two prongs of capacity development. And with that new level of science, we will be able to sustainably manage the ocean. We have to move towards the high level panel that the prime minister uh, established that is recommended, the degraded management of the ocean based on science. 
Also, the plan includes 10 uh, science challenges. Uh, they are different, but you know, I would like to say that they resonate very well with the five topics that we discussed today in this session. So the process is simple. Like Professor Ntiba said, we will start with ocean literacy, engaging the public, engaging everyone and understanding what ocean means to us and how we affect the ocean. Then we move to observing, predicting the state of the ocean. Speaking about data, we will create a digital twin of the ocean, uh, describing the past, current, and future state of the ocean. And with that, we'll be able to feed the data and knowledge into managing the ocean, using the approaches that, again, Professor Ntiba and some other people say, through maritime special planning or in protected areas, mitigating climate change, helping uh, people to, to get food from the ocean, and grew economy in sustainable manner. So I think the decade will become um, the largest scientific program uh, in, in ocean sciences. And uh, I think it, it, even in the history of the sciences, and then if successful, we develop the science that would fit for purpose for managing the ocean. And also it will trigger behavior change in, in how we deal uh, with the ocean, how we harmoniously can, can relate with that. So that's, that's uh, a part uh, of a response that relates to, to ocean science per se. Thank you so much, uh, Vladimir, and, and thank you to all the panelists. And I would just say that what we heard now is that, as Michael said, uh, the deep sea exploration is already having vast amounts of data down to centimeter details. Uh, we heard from Remy that uh, there is a deep interest to uh, build a set of systems of monitoring on the private vessels all around the world and to share those data as reflected in the sustainable ocean principles. And as you said yourself, Vladimir, we are now at the start of this fantastic decade, the biggest research project for the ocean ever. I mean, now can bring all these resources together, these ambitions together, and I think we can really build a transparent and good quality system to share and, uh, and get the insights of ocean data. Eric, so that if I may, if I may, Eric, may I compliment what you said? Uh, because I think what is really important, this is a, a talk between science and business. So mm. I would like to thank, uh, first of all, the platform, the ocean, sustainable platform, ocean uh, business platform, uh, for being our wonderful partner. That is really important. And I would like to, to present uh, to, to the audience now the, the business brief that prepared, we prepared on the role of industry in the decade. So I don't want to take more uh, of your time, but the business brief on the role of, uh, of industry in the decade will be presented soon. It will be the day after tomorrow. There is a special session at the Virtual Ocean Dialogues. And this session is devoted to the brief. It's called Advancing Science for Sustainable Ocean Businesses, a unique opportunity for the private sector. So that will be an answer to the question, how we can engage together. So I hope very much you can attend. It will be very interesting. Thank you. Thank you for that, Vladimir. I'm looking forward to joining you and everybody else in <laughs> that session as well. It's a busy week for ocean meetings. It's the virtual ocean dialogues and lots of other separate meetings. And on Thursday, 6.30 European time, the launch of the business brief uh, in that <laughs> session at the World Economic Forum and WRI joint session. So thank you for that, for this panel. And we will now move to the fifth and last panel of today before we go into the summary panel. Uh, and in this panel, we are addressing one of the main concern, 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 concerns for the, in the ocean. I mean, that is, that is maybe the picture that most people get when we talk about ocean health and productivity. What about plastic? What about runoffs? What about acidification? These are very, very difficult challenges. And with us in this panel, we have Marco Lambertini, Director of uh, Director General of WWF International. We have uh, Mr. Bertrand Camus, CEO of Suez. And we have Ms. Inge Andersen, Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. So who's better than to kick this off than Marco Lambertini, Director General of WWF. Please, the floor is yours. Thank, thank, thank you very, very much, thank first of all, to the UN Global Compact for organizing this um, very important event and keep the focus on the, on the, and the momentum on the ocean. So I'd like to start by saying that, uh, and I guess the one around this, this panel for sure, uh, I know that, but uh, it's important to stress that on one hand, the science is clear, the ocean is in crisis and the challenges the ocean is facing are unprecedented. And, and on the other hand, we also understand increasingly the consequences of that crisis. 
uh, and, and the root causes as well. The ocean crisis is ecological as much as humanitarian with hundreds of millions of people's livelihood, jobs, uh, nutritious and healthy food, depending on the healthy ocean. Pollution is one of the ocean's plagues uh, and 80% of the ocean pollutants are actually originated um, on land. From agricultural runoff, uh, nutrients, pesticides, even antibiotics have been detected recently as a major concern, to industrial pollutants, metals, organic pollutants of various nature, and of course, plastic, perhaps the most vivid reminder of our, how can I say, wasteful, unsustainable, um, careless relationship um, with, the with the planet and with the ocean in particular. But the plastic value chain we know is complex. And so there is no real silver bullet, but the only option we have to curb plastic pollution is to have an integrated set of solutions around perhaps four main streams. First of all, we need to reduce the use of plastic, the unnecessary one. Second, we need to improve dramatically collection. Thirdly, we need to scale up dramatically <laughs> recycling. And lastly, but not least, um, is uh, uh, invest in alternatives for the future. And this requires a behavioral, a technological, and a regulatory change, and also requires consumers, business, and regulators to work together. From a business perspective, uh, there are two major roles that business can play. One is to be transparent and serious in first of all auditing the, uh, it, its plastic footprint and then develop a plan to most effectively address it. And secondly, mm -hmm. is to support a global framework uh, that creates a level playing field for action with a clear vision, clear targets, clear deadlines and accountability. Learning from previous joint uh, global efforts like the Montreal Protocol in addressing uh, ozone uh, depleting gases. By the way, addressing the issue and triggering innovation and business opportunities as well. Plastic is as serious uh, and other pollutants issues are serious as required and global in nature requiring a global, uh, a global effort. Let me just finish by saying that we're in the middle of the COVID-19 uh, economic recovery, we have a major opportunity to leap forward to a new economic model that embraces sustainability and respect for the environment and addressing pollutants and plastic uh, amongst them is no exception. And so uh, let's really take this chance to build a future, a safe future for our children and for our life on earth that puts rich nature, stable climate and a healthy ocean at the center of our society and economy. It's, it's a great opportunity, it's an opportunity we cannot miss. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Marco. Uh, uh, very, very encouraging. Very clear call to action, that is. Sure. And talking about action, um, s stopping waste entering the ocean is one of the key issues here. And, and who's better to talk about ocean stewardship in the future than one of the key companies actually taking care of waste before it enters into the ocean? So, Mr. Bertrand Camus, CEO sure. of Suez, one of the large waste management companies in the world. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to, to all. And I can only concur with uh, what Mr. Lambertini said. Um, definitely, uh, the quantity of contaminants and pollutants that are reaching our oceans is absolutely uh, crazy. Uh, and it is only going to increase if we don't act uh, stiffly and, uh, and quickly uh, to prevent that. Um, plastic, I will come back on that because there are very interesting initiatives that have been uh, taken by the, by the business community uh, with the creation of the Alliance for the Elimination of Plastic Waste. But uh, as was said earlier, I mean, uh, contaminants of all sorts are also uh, being dumped in the oceans through uh, wastewater, uh, rainwater systems, and knowing that the population is growing uh, and, and very often on uh, coastal areas where uh, they can find food in the, uh, in the ocean. Uh, what is uh, needed to really uh, change uh, this, uh, this, this trend is uh, uh, regulation, uh, cooperation, and, uh, and innovation. Um, regulation, for example, banning the single-use plastic uh, would be something that uh, could be done uh, very, very quickly and, uh, and implemented. Um, and I think that we need, we need to move forward in that direction. Cooperation, I'm totally... Uh, uh, positive about it because we see uh, not only the citizen mobilization, but also a large corporation. It was mentioned earlier in previous panels, 
uh, which are really taking seriously those, uh, those, those issues and uh, everyone willing really to, 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 to change things. And innovation, I think when we look at uh, all those uh, contaminants being either liquid or, or solid, uh, it's not an issue of technology. All the technology exists. Uh, it's just finding a way to implement them, uh, finance them, uh, so that we, we can be uh, efficient. And, and for that, we really need to be also uh, very much uh, conscious about the level of development of each country. Uh, we cannot ask a uh, low and, and medium uh, income co uh, country to go directly into recycling and, and reuse of, uh, of materials. They first have to uh, ensure basic sanitation, which means collection and containment. And then building from there, uh, we can develop uh, uh, recycling and recovery of, uh, of materials. Just uh, a mention to the uh, Alliance to End Plastic Waste. So uh, it's a non-for-profit organization with 40 members. We are one of the founders. And you will find there uh, all the major uh, plastic uh, producers and users being uh, uh, bottling companies uh, or uh, cosmetic companies. And they are really uh, dedicating a large sum of investment to really develop concrete pro projects in the countries where today uh, plastic waste is not properly managed. And, uh, developed around that strategy of improving collection, containment, and then from there recycling and uh, and reuse. And for me, that's uh, that's a great example of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, uh, mobilization to uh, solve this uh, this this problem that uh, uh, is going to kill us all if we don't act uh, quickly uh, uh, to prevent uh, plastic to end up in the oceans. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Petran. Uh, and uh, that's a very important point from the industry. I mean, extremely important perspectives on how to address this. The technologies are there. Uh, we just have to scale it up. So that leads us to you, Ms. Inge Andersen, Executive Director of the UN Environment Program. One planet, the ocean plays a big role and a healthy ocean is needed for a healthy planet. What is your ambition for the next 10 years towards the 2030 agenda? Please. Well, I think we, we need to start with SDG 12, sustainable production and consumption. Understanding that it's our, the way that we interact, how we, how we consume and produce, how we don't consume and produce, how we consume and produce and waste, and how that absence of circularity in our economies are driving uh, wasteful behaviors across the board. Um, driving pollution, a crisis, the waste crisis, driving the degradation of nature crisis and driving the climate crisis. So if we understand that the way we interact with, with our own consumption and production needs fundamentally shifting, because when it comes to oceans, we know that land-based sources of pollutions uh, are driving and critically impacting the health of our oceans. We can add fishing here, et cetera, et cetera, but it is what we do on land that is really uh, causing uh, this, this critical issue. So whether it's marine litter, uh, whether it's uh, nutrient and wastewater, as we just heard from the previous speaker, it degrades our coasts and our oceans uh, in, and all our wastewater that we cause effluent, uh, untreated effluent into, into, into the ocean. So moving on that front will be critical. But also understanding clearly the science behind all of this, and this is what UNEP seeks to do, understanding the sources of these wastes and understanding uh, what kind of investments we need to put in um, to ensure that waste can remain in, not waste, that it can remain in circularity, that what has had its usefulness is constructed in such a way that it can be taken apart and reused again. Nowadays, we take things out of the environment and when we're done with it, we discard them back into the environment. Those days are gone. We could do that, maybe, not very good. But anyway, when we were a few billion, but now we're nearly nine and we cannot continue ejecting our waste into the environment. Secondly, and we just heard from the private sector, there are models for this. There are models so we don't have that rich soup of of energy and carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and plastics and goodness knows what else we're putting into the ocean, but rather that we find use bio refinery, waste separations, return logistics, cascading organic flows, nutrient recovery. There are models and there is money to be made in this business. If the regulatory setting is such that businesses step in and lean in. So the private sector has a huge role to play. And three, 
um, with COVID-19, we've seen an added pressure of waste, uh, medical hazardous uh, and plastics come into the waste stream. In many countries, we've seen huge donations, which we celebrate of PPE, but these countries may not have incineration, may not have all the kind of hazardous waste or even storage facilities needed. So here there is, a, and we at UNEP are working a lot with our friends in WHO and others precisely to deal with this, but this has taught us something. And the very last point, as we are about to re-stimulate our economies and put taxpayers' money into businesses, there is an opportunity here to flick that green switch, or maybe I should say the blue switch, so that that stimulus is one that will really drive um, a greening and enabling of business community and society at large to do what Marco said, preserve our oceans, preserve our nature, and preserve our climate. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inger. And I, I think that was uh, a slightly optimistic tone in a very <laughs> sincere topic. And uh, I think what, just to sum up what the three panelists have, have shared with us, we need bold action and we need a master plan really rolled out globally uh, to address these issues. Technology is there, the, comp the, the knowledge is there, the, the competencies are there, but we need a strong united and global effort to really address this problem. And the time is now. Uh, all the stimulus packages coming out should recognize the uh, value of healthy oceans. I think that is also a good segue to a closing panel that will sum up uh, the key issues here today. It will be moderated by my good colleague Sturla Henriksen, our special advisor Ocean at the UN Global Compact. And I will thank all of you from this last panel for those important remarks. And I will give the floor to him, Sturla. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, um, for these great uh, uh, discussions. Now we will uh, uh, we are drawing uh, towards the end of this uh, this conference and uh, and um, as the first speaker here uh, will tie back to what I mentioned in my introductory remarks about the uh, uh, financial markets because we need financial mechanisms to um, ensure that capital is uh, allocated to uh, advancing sustainable ocean business. And in this work, we have had a very uh, strong and good partnership with the Euronext, which is the largest uh, stock exchange in continental Europe. And uh, we're very honored to have today uh, Mr. Stefan Bujna, CEO and chairman of the managing board, to give you his reflections on uh, this important topic. So please, Stefan. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me today. Uh, this is a timely conference because clearly uh, at the moment where uh, everyone is screaming, uh, I want my country first, my cash at home, uh, I want to make my country great again. Uh, we need, uh, we need uh, a wake up call from uh, both the private sector and the public sector to say uh, that uh, either we fail separately or we succeed uh, together and, uh, and to, to, to try to align their behavior to make uh, multilateral cooperation great again. So thank you for organizing this, this event. And um, it's, I want to, to share with you some concrete uh, tips about how the, the capital market and exchanges can make uh, these uh, great ambitions concrete and tangible by facilitating uh, the retail implementation of, of those great ambitions. Because clearly governments uh, have injected massive uh, uh, fiscal stimulus, central banks have injected a massive uh, monetary stimulus uh, in the in the real economy. So, if we want all those rivers of money to to find their ways towards uh, sustainable uh, driven projects, uh, uh, green uh, financing, blue financing, they need to reach the right target. So, the last mile of these ambitions will be delivered uh, by uh, by uh, by capital markets and the financial sector. So, um, uh, clearly, in the consultation launched by the European Commission. Uh, in May, uh, in the renewed uh, sustainable finance strategy, they found out that uh, uh, there was a gap of 1.5 uh, trillion of investment needed to deliver uh, the, um, 
the green uh, finance economy. So this huge investment effort will have to come from the private sector. So clearly the governments are em embarked into the European Green Deal investment plan, into the InvestEU program, the European Investment Bank is doing its share. But the scale of what is needed uh, it, it requires that we go beyond the capacity of the public sector. So what, what we do at Shorenex to promote investment in sustainable projects, and in a minute I'll, I'll go into more details in what we are trying to do in blue finance, is that we, we try to reactivate our, our core mission because what exchanges do for 300, 400, 500 years is to connect people who have great ideas, great projects, but no resources with people uh, who have a lot of resources and who look for yield, but who have no ideas. Basically, we fix the problems of the people who have uh, too much money and, uh, and, no, uh, and no, no ideas with the ones who have too many ideas and not enough money. And uh, what we do is that we, we first promote the, the transparency of our issuers. And we believe that by helping companies disclosing their sustainability uh, strategy uh, and their transition achievements in full transparency, they can capture the attention of investors in a much more powerful manner. So we, we do that by guiding uh, companies towards uh, ESG reporting and disclosure methodologies. We promote flows of investment in sustainable projects. We work very closely with major institutional investors to provide them with the ESG benchmark indices, listed products, data, everything that is needed to understand uh, really what green means and what blue means. And on a wider scale, <coughs> we support the development of a, of a strong uh, and vibrant cooperative ESG ecosystem because the, the, that doesn't work in silos. You need a to align all the stakeholders to make things happen for, for real. So that's why your initiative in this respect is very important. So governments and regulators help. They help a lot because they, they provide uh, standards, they provide uh, taxonomies, and those standards and those taxonomies are very important. And we want them to be designed in a sort of a neutral way, not to be controlled by a small group of, uh, of purely uh, uh, market-driven uh, people who who might have a, a commercial agenda, as it is the case in some of the fields of the finance industry. And, um, and we believe that uh, aligning our efforts to, to put forward a set of standards covering taxonomy, green bone standards, what is nicknamed as the Paris Align Index Benchmarks, disclosure regulations, all this is very important to, to build the, the backbone of, 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 of sustainable finance. So Euronext is fully committed to supporting sustainable development agenda, and in particular, the blue finance agenda because, because we operate exchanges in seven European countries, France, Belgium, Holland, uh, Portugal, the UK, Ireland, and Norway. And all your next countries have long traditions of fishing and shipping. All your next countries have, have uh, large ports. Uh, you know, uh, the, your next countries are the Atlantic facet of, of Europe. It's, uh, it's all about Lisboa, Porto, uh, Le Havre, Bordeaux, uh, uh, Antwerpen, Rotterdam, uh, Copenhagen, Bergen, uh, Oslo, uh, Dublin, London, etc., and uh, all the United countries have uh, seafaring traditions, have uh, have uh, sea tourism activities, and I'm mentioning all those points because in order for any sustainable effort in companies to uh, to to be uh, impactful, you need to relate to teams, to relate to employees, to relate to to, to stakeholders. And when I say that all this economic activity, all this blue finance activity is rooted in you know, common history and a long tradition of maritime exploration. That's precisely because we found out that if you want to resonate with, with the minds and the hearts of, of teams and employees, you have to remind them that, that, that uh, Amundsen and Nansen are, are great Norwegian uh, sailors and explorers, oh, like Bavans and Tasman in the Netherlands, like, like Vasco de Gama and Magellan in, in, in Portugal, like Champlain and, Car and Cartier in France. So, so we are trying to, to, to to embark more than, than just the corporate, more the companies that beyond the annual reports to make sure that employees are behind us and stakeholders are, are behind us. So we have a strong commitment to the United Nations initiatives. In 2015, we became a, a member of the UN Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiatives. In 18, we endorsed a task force on climate, climate related financial disclosure recommendations. More recently, in 19, we engaged with the UN uh, Global Compact Sustainable Oceans Business Group, led by Eric. And, uh, and based on these principles, we are about to launch a, a blue bond li finance listing, a blue bond listing offer that will uh, be a pioneer uh, exchange initiative 
in supporting the financing of a uh, blue economy and achieving uh, the ocean uh, agenda tipping point discussed uh, along the various sessions today. So all the companies that spoke today are, are welcome to list their bonds on this blue bond listing offer. And in addition, I'm very pleased to announce that today, Euronext has signed the UN Global Compact Principles and the Nine Ocean Principles. So um, uh, we are trying to do our best to, to provide investors with a set of uh, sustainability indices, uh, including a new Euronext and Ocean Index. Uh, we are trying to do our best to, to launch new uh, exchange-traded funds uh, uh, related to, uh, to ocean products. I mean, it's uh, potentially a reservoir of 24.5 billion uh, euros of, of investment. Uh, we do our best to provide services to issuers to enhance their ESG literacy and their understanding of, of blue finance. And, um, and we are building dedicated ESG market segments, uh, having started with green bonds and preparing actively to enlarge this offer to blue bonds, to, to social bonds, and to other sustainability bonds. So in a nutshell, to conclude, I believe that capital markets can give a critical contribution to both the economic recovery and the implementation or translation for real of what we are discussing today with concrete solutions to protect and develop the blue economy. I believe that the opportunities arising for, from the post-COVID-19 and the necessary link between the, the green or blue counterparties to public money injection and the leverage of private money injection is uh, it, 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 we require this type of, of group that, uh, that, uh, that the capital markets can provide. And I believe that uh, governments, regulators, and business uh, leaders will benefit from, from better financing and stronger capital markets really driven towards uh, blue finance. So thank you for your time. Let's grow sustainable finance together for Europe, which is our home, but also for the world. So thank you so much, uh, Stefan. I think uh, for these very inspiring words, and uh, I think that you underscore exactly how uh, important the, uh, the financial sector is for uh, promoting and advancing sustainable um, uh, ocean business. It's a, it's a key enabler uh, in, that, uh, in that regard. So thank you so much. We look forward to cooperating with you going forward. Now, uh, we are running a bit uh, behind schedule, uh, but um, uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, the last speaker of today. I'm sure that in a normal world, he would have been extremely excited to welcome us all to his uh, home country. Uh, I'm equally sure that uh, today he is uh, he's as excited uh, to invite us uh, to his home country next year. So uh, please, uh, uh, Your Excellency Ricardo Serrao Santos, Minister of the Sea from Portugal, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Tula. Uh, yes, I would, <laughs> would like to have you here, all of you, but we have postponed it and we'll uh, have a, a new occasion for sure. And uh, hello, Eric and Stefan and all the muted and uh, Eden participants, as well as the participants that have provided very interesting questions. Uh, all dear friends, I was amazed for the great contributions today and also for the 10 ambitions and recommendations for growing sustainable ocean business set by the United Nations Global Compact Report. These are sharp ambitions and recommendations that we, have to follow, we, we must follow and study and follow. A true roadmap as, this, as it said in the report, to mobilize our collective energy, inspiration, and dedication. And we need this. As a closing remark in this panel, I would like to follow on the step of proactive optim optimism. Under the United Nations 2030 agenda, the SDG 14 is one of the most synergetic SDGs. SDG 14 is a critical enabler of poverty and hunger alleviation. Still, the two main problems in our planet, in our planet and uh, uh, they will do a uh, alleviation of hunger and poverty via an environmental, sustainable economic growth and promoting social well-being. The ocean and seas are, in fact, as was said today, major source of water, food, jobs, business, income also, and employment, but also part of the hydrological cycle and the engine for the carbon that is influencing the weather worldwide. If we choose to prioritize responsible, sustainable business models like blue biotechnology or integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, 
foster positive impact in innovation and focus on developing solutions like sea forestation that can both contribute to restoring ecosystems' ability to thrive while providing jobs and livelihood for many, then we are also attaining SDG 14 goals. We can also think that responsible consumption and production, sustainable management of natural resources or reduction of waste are critical for ending overfishing, sustainable managing marine and coastal ecosystems and reducing marine pollution. It is very important to acknowledge that the future of the ocean and human prosperity are inextricably interlinked. Many do not understand that, but they are. The next decade, 2021-2013, is also being prepared as a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And we all must embrace all efforts to push countries' action for a sustainable management of the ocean based on strengthened and collaborative science. We'll be operating at the last margin of time that is left. This is our opportunities to strengthen and to balance nature and business development in a cooperative path while investing in decarbonization, energy transition, transition, sustainable mobility, natural capital appreciation, and the search for an increasing circular economy. Just to fi finish, I would like to say, as Minister of the Sea of Portugal, that our government is aware and engaged in taking action and committed with the 2030 Agenda Objectives for Sustainable Development. Portugal, together with Kenya, will pursue their work on the organization of the United Nations Conference that was postponed due to this pandemic crisis. But we hope that soon, jointly with the United Nations, a new date is set and announced to everyone hoping that will be that will be a great moment to reflect and underline ocean's importance in our planet and to human being. Thank you very much for your attention and see you soon in Lisbon. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Really, we look forward to seeing you in, in uh, Lisbon uh, next year. Um, before thanking you all, let me just remind you that the recording of this, uh, this uh, seminar will be available on YouTube and you can also find the Ocean Stewardship Report published on the uh, homepage of the UN Global Compact. So, uh, a warm thanks to all our uh, participants, to all our speakers. Uh, thank you for attending this uh, seminar. I hope you have enjoyed it as uh, much as I have. To me, this, uh, this conference has uh, carried the true hallmarks of the UN Global Compact. The uh, ability to convene knowledgeable key stakeholders across uh, national, regulatory, industrial, and academic boundaries for facts-based constructive discussions. I think we can all agree that uh, this is something that we really need in our uh, world today. I also hope that uh, you, like me, felt this uh, conference to be both informative, important, and also inspiring for the important uh, work uh, uh, going forward and as a kickoff for this uh, decade of delivery and decade of ocean uh, science. So with these words, warm thanks again Take care, stay safe, and uh, hope to see you, uh, if not um, before in uh, Lisbon, uh, then um, uh, to see you in Lisbon, and uh, maybe also before that uh, virtually or, or physically. Take good care and thank you for now.